right, let's get started. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay. <laughs> oh, that clock is off. Use the light you have. Ah, that clock is off. Good <laughs> Practice run. I'll go up and ready. Yeah. Yeah. Which one is it? You can tell us tough to warm up the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No worries. Yeah. 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 It's like I put up on a server. Yeah. Design. You didn't watch your buddy. Yeah. 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 Y
So yeah, I'm John. I work with Rob Crane primarily at Liverpool, but also with these other people, uh, including Ben, who's sitting right there, who's hosting me generously in the US. So yeah, I'm going to be talking to you about the amazing effects of black hole feedback and how uh, on the gas content of halos in eagles. So, uh, so cheers. The gas universe in eagle and the X-ray universe as well, just as a nice illustration there. Uh, so, uh, I don't think I need to motivate the, uh, the importance of the missing baryons problem in, in astrophysics uh, to this audience, but uh, just in case, I will do anyway. Uh, so, as we know from uh, measurements of the CMB, uh, we have uh, constrained the baryon contents of the universe uh, very well, about 0 0.15, 0 0.16. Uh, but galaxy surveys really indicate that um, only about 5% of these baryons actually exist in the form of stars or as stellar remnants. Um, and so you might expect the rest of these baryons to exist as sort of diffuse gas uh, around, around galaxies, uh, diffuse circumgalactic halos. But estimates of the gas content of halos that we get from X-ray emission, uh, from uh, absorption in quasar sight lines, uh, tend to fall far short of the cosmic average still. Um, and it's only really in the most massive halos of groups and clusters uh, that we converge to the cosmic average. Um, so it kind of indicates that we need some sort of uh, ejective feedback process to, to remove gas from halos if, if uh, we're short of what we expect to be there. Um, and ejective feedback is known to be uh, kind of critical for regulating the growth of galaxies. So um, this kind of seems like a connection that we need to make. Um, so let's look at a, a kind of cartoon model of galaxy formation, so to speak, from this, from this review here. And you can see we have a galaxy and it sits within its uh, circumgalactic halo of diffuse gas. Um, and then you have this kind of interplay uh, between uh, gas accretion and then star formation and gas outflow that sort of self-regulates the formation of the galaxy. And these outflows can come in the form of gas which is, falls back onto the galaxy and is recycled, or it can come in the form of gas that is outflowing altogether from the halo and is completely removed. Um, and we lack a, a real sort of complete and coherent model for for how all these processes sort of go together to regulate the contents of halos and how feedback really impacts these things. So yeah, we, we, we really lack uh, a model for how the structure and the baryon content of the halos, as well as the X-ray properties, which is particularly relevant in a high energy talk, um, are, are controlled by these processes. And arguably simulations where we calibrate the efficiencies of this feedback on key galaxy properties, to reproduce key, key galaxy properties, can make the most authoritative predictions for how these processes all interact and, and work. Um, and due to the nature of simulations, they allow us to connect the present day properties of galactic halos that we can observe with their formation history over time. So that's sort of what I aim to do with this talk and really investigate uh, the origins of the different gas contents of halos. And I'm gonna do this using uh, the Eagle simulations, um, which have this long unwieldy <laughs> name here. Um, but, but uh, the Eagle simulations give us this, re this realistic galaxy population with this real diverse range of morphologies. So we get a nice Hubble tuning fork diagram of mock images from Eagle here. Um, and we have sufficient volume, about 100 megaparsecs cubed, uh, to resolve thousands of approximately L star galaxies and their halos with, with about uh, somewhere between a million and 10 million uh, SPH particles. Um, and we implement energetically feasible feedback, which we calibrate to reproduce uh, really three critical uh, stellar properties of galaxies, uh, namely the galaxy stellar mass function, which you see here, um, the black hole mass to stellar mass relation, and the sizes of galaxies. Uh, we also implement uh, self-consistent cooling and enrichment with, uh, with hydrogen, helium, and nine other uh, of the most important um, heavy elements for cooling. But the real critical uh, aspect of Eagle is that we don't calibrate it at all on the gaseous universe. So it's really ripe for analyzing, um, analyzing the gas content of halos. Um, because we're, we're, we can be sure that we're not just getting out what we put in, essentially. Um, we've calibrated on stellar quantities, and so we can really interpret what happens as a result to the gaseous universe. Um, so with that in mind, let's take a look at the gas fractions of Eagle halos. So here, more specifically, the gas fraction I define as the total gas mass within the viral radius R200 divided by the total mass of the halo. Um, and I show this as a function of halo mass here, and I've also divided it through by the cosmic fraction. So 
uh, rather than approaching about 0 0.15, 0 0.16 in the most massive halos, we approach one, so to speak, here. But you can see in lower mass halos, we're, we're very deficient compared to the cosmic fraction, as I, as I said before. Um, and we also have this really significant scatter here about the uh, running median, which I compute using this locally weighted scatter plot smoothing method, which is really handy. Um, so if we want to understand how the gas content of halos is regulated, we better understand the, uh, the origin of this scatter, essentially. Um, that's a redshift zero, I'll note. Um, so really, maybe the first uh, obvious test that we should do is check whether galaxies have less gas simply because they formed more of their gas budget into stars. That's maybe the first thing that you want to test. So here are the stellar fractions in Eagle, um, again normalized by the, the cosmic fraction here. And we really want to know whether residuals uh, in the gas fraction correlate with residuals in the stellar fraction, which would indicate whether if you formed more stars, you've used up more of your gas. So what we'll do is we'll color this plot by uh, deviations from this running median uh, stellar fraction. So you, in a sense, get an idea of whether if you formed more stars at your fixed halo mass, um, you will have less gas available. Uh, so when we do that, it looks like this, which really looks like there's no particular correlation to speak of. Uh, so this is, this is deviation from the running median um, uh, stellar fraction here. Um, so it seems like differences in how much stellar mass you've assembled aren't really the answer here. Um, so the gas has to be being removed by some other mechanism. Um, so maybe the first candidate that we want to look at is black hole feedback. Um, we know that um, from previous simulations that the energy liberated through the formation and growth of a black hole is comparable to the overall binding energy of the halo that it lives in. Um, so maybe we should check the AGN feedback rate first. Um, so if we do so, Here's what it looks like. So again, this is actually this is deviations or residuals from the from the black hole mass accretion rate as a function of halo mass here. Um, so you can see that at fixed mass, there doesn't appear to be any correlation at all between the gas fraction and the AGN feedback rate, which I quantify as just the uh, the mass growth rate of the black hole. Um, so that's pretty surprising. It seems like the AGN isn't really doing anything to the gas fractions. Um, so we want to kind of quantify this lack of correlation or maybe future correlations that we find using the Spearman rank correlation coefficient. Uh, so at fixed mass, we want to know whether a gas fraction and whatever we're coloring by here are correlated. Um, so we do this by defining a mass window um, in halo mass that contains 100 galaxies and compute the Spearman rank correlation coefficient and sort of move it along in halo mass. And when we do that, it looks like this. So from minus 1 to 1, uh, as in perfectly anticorrelated and perfectly correlated. And you can see that we don't really find much correlation at all here. And we shade this where the p-value of the correlation is, is greater than 0 0.01, which is actually more conservative than the usually adopted value of 0 0.05 for non-significance in a, in a correlation test such as this. So it seems like ongoing black hole feedback isn't the answer. But, uh, oh, I'll also note that the AGN feedback rate varies very, uh, over very short timescales um, in the Eagle simulations. So we integrate our feedback back over 100 mega years to just check that we're not just having the correlation washed out by scatter. And it seems like this is the case. So that's what, it, that's what the correlations look like when we, uh, when we integrate it back. So perhaps we really need to be considering some other aspect of the black holes. Uh, so previous simulation work, if you look in Richard Bauer's 2017 paper, we found that um, when you form a hot halo um, around a galaxy, you inhibit um, the ability for um, star formation driven outflows to actually remove gas from the halo. And this buildup of gas in the, in the center of the halo can, um, can lead to really rapid uh, nonlinear black hole growth. Um, and this happens at early times. This happens uh, sort of redshifts one to three. So uh, perhaps this is where uh, the baryon lifting and, and all the impact on the gas fraction actually occurs. Um, so really what we want to be looking at is some integrated quantity of the black hole growth over time, which is most easily accessed by just straightforwardly the black hole mass. So if I make the same plot that I've been showing you before, gas fractions, um, it looks like this for black hole mass, which is incredibly striking, I think. Um, you have this amazing color gradient here at fixed mass uh, with the residuals from the black hole mass to halo mass relation. Um, and more, and more critically, you see that uh, if you have a more massive black hole than is typical for your halo mass, you tend to be really gas poor and vice versa for less massive black holes. 
And this correlation is really most prevalent in this kind of L-star Milky Way halo mass range where the AGN has really affected the gas content of halos. We quantify the correlation just with a particular value of the Spearman rank correlation coefficient at 10 to the 12.5, which kind of corresponds to Milky Way-like halo mass. Um, yeah. What, so, so L star is down at, at, at 12 or 12.5. Yeah. By the time you're at 13.5, uh, you're really talking about groups. Mm -hmm. And by 14.5, you're talking about pretty big clusters. Uh -huh. So is that, in fact, what these are in your simula simulation? Yeah, yeah. So we form group and cluster scale halos within the simulations, yeah. Um, and, uh, and interestingly, yeah, as you, as you say, we, we find that the correlation actually uh, kind of ceases to be negative into this regime. So the correlation actually turns over. Um, and this is really due to the uh, decreasing ability of the AGN to remove gas from these, from these deeper potentials, uh, from these higher mass halos. So, yeah, the correlation turns over. Um, so remarkably, we seem to have this kind of sub-parsec scale black hole growth um, that is affecting sort of, hundred of hundreds of kiloparsec scale uh, halo properties um, and really dramatically altering um, the formation of galaxies. Um, so it seems like the black hole is the engine to, to really setting what the content of, of circumgalactic halos are. Um, but really we want to see what the true origin of this effect is based on the kind of initial conditions of the simulation. So what makes uh, a galaxy particularly grow a, a larger or, or, or smaller black hole over its, uh, over its history. Um, so to, to start considering this, we, we consider the results that were found using uh, the OWL simulations with Booth and Shea 2010. And they find that um, the black hole mass is actually go governed by uh, the binding energy of the inner underlying dark matter halo. Um, so if you have a really tightly bound uh, dark matter halo, you need more energy to unbind uh, the gas in your halo, so that your black hole has to actually grow more massive to regulate the uh, gas inflow, essentially. So really, this suggests that we should see a correlation with the, uh, with the binding energy of the underlying dark matter structure, um, which we quantify as E2500, which is just the binding energy within R2500, of the overdensity there. Um, and so if we color by this, uh, which is the, uh, the inner halo binding energy from an equivalent dark matter-only simulation, so we don't worry about um, uh, the effects of, of baryons being removed from the halo washing out or exaggerating any correlations. It's just the underlying dark matter halo binding. Um, we find still a really spectacular um, correlation, which is in some ways slightly unintuitive. Uh, we really find that um, tightly bound halos actually retain less gas at fixed mass than less tightly bound halos. Um, and this is really through the effect of the black hole. Um, so uh, this, uh, of course, the binding energy of the dark matter halo really only depends on the initial conditions of your simulation. Um, it's kind of written in by the initial dark matter structure. So this is like the fundamental cosmological origin of your, of your scatter and your gas fraction. But the effect critically has to be transmitted through the black hole. Uh, we actually find that if you take the black holes out of the simulation altogether, the cor correlation flips over, and you find that more tightly bound halos do indeed retain more gas, which is maybe what you'd intuitively expect. Um, so yeah, we seem to have found uh, the, the origin of this, of, of, of really why some halos have more gas in than others. But this is a really difficult to test scenario for many reasons, uh, one of which is that you, you really need uh, dynamical measurements of black hole masses, which are very difficult to, to obtain. We only really have about 100 of them. Um, so really, we need to find a correlation that links this picture with a more accessible galaxy property. Um, so previous work with Eagle has suggested that more tightly bound uh, dark matter halos, which form earlier, um, also exhibit lower present-day star formation rates in their central galaxies. And this is because of a shifting of the star formation history to earlier times. So this kind of hints that we might see a correlation with the star formation rate, which is, after all, a much easier thing to measure observationally. So if we try this out, we do find this really spectacular correlation. So gas-rich halos at fixed mass also exhibit higher star formation rates. Um, so you see, we get this almost perfect correlation here going on. Um, 
So really, is this just the effect of the binding energy, or does the star formation kind of, kind of wrap into this whole story I've been telling you about, about the effects of the black hole? So I'm going to kind of try and tie this together by returning to the idea of the self-regulation of galaxy formation that I, I presented, or that I sort of suggested to you at the start. So you have gas inflow coming into your galaxy, and this has to be balanced out somehow um, by either uh, forming that gas into stars or ejecting it, either through supernovae or AGN. And uh, supernovae tend to be less ejective. They tend to eject gas into the halo, but not entirely remove it from the system altogether, whereas the AGN is powerful enough to actually fully remove it. Um, and so we need to kind of understand the, the interplay between all of these processes. So let's take a sort of case study at fixed halo mass. If you have a halo which is more tightly bound, uh, just purely due to where it is in the early universe, the, the underlying dark matter halo is more, more tightly bound. You have this elevated gas inflow onto the galaxy because supernova feedback is less efficient at removing gas from the halo when it's still kind of forming stars and is just regulated by star formation and supernova feedback. So to somehow regulate this elevated gas inflow, the black hole has to grow faster. Um, and it's then quicker to take over this self-regulation process from star formation. Um, and because, it, because it's quicker to do this, it, it uh, significantly depletes the halo gas, thanks to this correlation that I showed you earlier. Um, and so when this, this halo gas is ejected, you, you either quench your star formation, or star formation just isn't required to regulate the inflow of gas anymore because, because it's essentially been removed from the system. So tightly bound halos um, with really overmassive black holes are going to exhibit lower star formation rates. And vice versa, late forming, uh, le less tightly bound halos will be on the flip side. They'll, have, they'll still be star formation regulated and they'll still be gas rich. So now we want some way of testing, testing this and using, um, we, we need some sort of proxy for the gas fraction now, which again is very difficult to obtain. Um, so there's sort of two ways you could really do this. Um, you either really want the, the X-ray luminosity of the halo, which at fixed temperature scales roughly with the density of the gas squared, or you, you can use potentially the thermal sun of Zoldovich effect, which again at fixed temperature scales as the gas density. Um, so these are the two proxies that we chose to try and examine this with. So how do we do this in Eagle? How do we obtain these quantities? Um, well, with X-rays, we use uh, we use APEC uh, to get um, to get spectra for all of the eleven elements that we trace in the simulation. So here are some examples: spectra from APEC for for six particular elements at ten to the seven Kelvin. And what we do is we can integrate these over the soft X-ray band, but we can choose any band we like. Um, we just particularly choose this Rosat soft band. Um, uh, but most importantly, we can rescale uh, all of these, these spectra and the, their contribution to the cooling rate and subsequent X-ray emission by the actual uh, individual chemical abundances in the gas particles. So we're not tied to any fixed uh, metallicity or, or tied to solar metallicities or anything like that. So that's all our abundances, I should say. Um, <laughs> So once we've uh, integrated all of these spectra up and summed all of the contributions to the cooling, uh, we can simply calculate the X-ray luminosity from this cooling function that we obtain. And for the SZ sort of flux, we compute the, the Compton Y parameter over the halo. Um, and when we do this, it looks like this. Uh, so here's X-ray luminosity as a function of halo mass and Compton Y parameter here. And I've colored it again by um, re the residuals in the gas fraction. And you can see that all the gas-rich halos um, also exhibit uh, similarly high X-ray luminosities and vice versa. And the same goes for the uh, Compton Y parameter. We get really nice correlations here. So the X-rays um, have this amazing dynamic range, you can see. Um, the upper and lower quartiles, which I've indicated with these gray lines, are separated by up to 1.5 dex um, at about 10 to the 12 solar masses. So we can really differentiate between gas-rich and gas-poor halos in this way with potential future X-ray instrumentation that's sensitive to, uh, to, to these kinds of luminosities. Um, and so if we want to test the influence of black hole growth, um, these two diagnostics have to respond to, to the black hole growth in the same way that the gas fraction did. So let's try having a look at that. So now gas fraction. Uh, uh, colored, uh, we're coloring by black hole mass again this time. And you can see that the same, the same correlation is right there. These undermassive black holes are also systematically bright in the X-rays, 
and bright in the SZ flux, so to speak. Um, again, we get this amazing separation in the X-rays here between uh, halos that host undermassive and overmassive black holes. Um, and of course, this is really, again, this is really hard to just directly measure uh, black hole masses. Uh, so we also find that uh, the star formation rate correlates really nicely with these diagnostics as well. Um, yeah, so again, this incredible splitting here. Um, so this was really the content of my first paper, sort of um, re revealing this picture of how, um, how the gas content of halos is regulated and how we might detect it in the X-ray. Um, but since this is a high-energy talk, I'll just talk a little bit about what I'm doing uh, kind of now. Um, in regards to analyzing this X-ray correlation and these, the, the scatter in the X-ray a little bit more. Because the X-rays may not perfectly just trace the gas content of halos. We know that X-ray luminosity is very sensitive to metallicity and density and temperature, all these sorts of things. So other processes going on within the galaxy, such as uh, outflows from star formation, may really affect, uh, affect the X-ray luminosity that we observe and, and the scatter that we're seeing here. So, before we probe, um, before we kind of investigate the scatter a little bit more, we should maybe check that the X-rays that we get in Eagle are actually realistic. Uh, so I'll demonstrate that to you. Um, so here's X-ray luminosity in the soft band again as a function of, of halo mass, um, and this is the 10 to 90 spread in, in Eagle with mean and median shown on there. Um, and you can see that at sort of L star um, halo masses. Uh, we're very well in line with um, XMM Newton and Chandra observations that were compiled in Zhang Tao Li's um, 2017 paper where he released the CGM mass um, results. So that kind of really gives us some, uh, some encouragement that uh, if we're studying L star halos and their gas content uh, in the X-ray uh, with Eagle, um, we're likely to be on the right track. So when we uh, try to understand the origin of the scatter in this X-ray luminosity and whether it is just down to the gas fraction, we, we tried a few things, but maybe uh, one of the main things that we wanted to work out was whether feedback from enriched star formation driven ejector um, can really drive up the X-ray luminosities of your halos. So if I kind of color this exact same plot, but now as a scatter, by a quantity that reflects that. So this is the, the amount of your X-ray luminosity contributed by gas which was in the ISM less than half a giga year ago and is now out in the halo and X-ray luminous. You can see we get this incredible correlation here. Uh, so at sort of L star halo masses, um, the most luminous halos are the ones where almost all of their luminosity comes from recently ejected material. And then there's this kind of like main sequence style thing down here which is just um, really emission from the diffuse halo and not from ejector. Um, so yeah, it seems really that star formation driven ejector can completely change the X-ray luminosities that you observe and drive it up by about four orders of magnitude really. Um, so when you're observing the X-ray kind of structure um, with maybe your future telescopes such as Lynx, you're likely not gonna be um, not going to be observing something that's uh, representative of the actual CGM gas content and structure. So is this kind of really the death knell for um, using the X-rays as a probe of the gas content of halos? Um, well, it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like that's the case. So this is the same plot again, but now I've, I'm coloring back to back to the black hole mass. So we have this correlation. But now if I remove all of this recently ejected, the contribution from all of this recently ejected gas to the X-ray luminosity, you can see we sort of chop off all of this kind of upscattered, um, all of these upscattered halos here in their luminosity. Uh, but you can see that the correlation that we, we now come to recognize is still really there in the X-rays. Um, and it's just being exaggerated here by um, the star formation driven ejector and if you recall that um, uh, the most gas-rich halos exhibited the highest star formation rates, it's no surprise that these halos up here with undermassive black holes and high star formation rates also have these very high X-ray luminosities. And this is something that, this is a picture that's really ripe for testing uh, with X-ray uh, observations. And I'd, you know, I'd love to talk to anybody who's interested about that. Um, so I've probably gone over my time. So uh, I'll leave you with my summary and I'll thank you very much for listening.
Uh, yeah, so we actually don't, we don't discriminate on, on morphology at all. So it's just simply all halos greater than 10 to the 11.5 in halo mass. So... Uh, so I don't know specifically the answer to that. The only uh, observational comparisons we've done in this case have been with these spiral galaxies, just simply because they were what was available to us. Um, and these, this, th those, um, so I'll go back to that. So um, this was only within the very central regions of, of the halo as a, as a comparison of just the realism of the X-ray luminosities. We've also compared to some ROSAT stacking observations from um, Mike Anderson's work um, at kind of higher masses, which I think cover um, a wider variety of morphological types and find, find fairly good agreements at, uh, from what we can possibly observe from ROSAT st stacking at these lower masses. Um, so yeah, I, d I don't know specifically the answer to that question. It's something you can do with Eagle because yeah. we do have more morphologies. Yeah, we, we have all the morphologies. We're going <laughs> <we're gonna discri> <laughs> to you know, investigate this picture through so various different like traces. Yeah. 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 Hey. So, so is a um, halo with an overmassive black hole, is that a quasar? Um, well, not necessarily. It may have been a quasar in the past, but now it... Well, it, it one. Um, uh, I mean, I, I don't know particularly. Um, we don't really dis uh, distinguish between quasar mode and and other modes of feedback in the simulation. Um, so yeah, I, I can't really, I can't really tell you much about that. I'm afraid. <laughs> so you opened the topic, noting that uh, the correlation for very poor with. So what does this, what, I'm just trying to make sure I understood the, the general point. Obviously, the only thing that's affecting, that, that, that's really driving black hole mass size is that the, the outflows and the various formation mechanisms. So there should have been, there is some correlation, there's got to be a correlation with ATN outflow and star formation, but it's integrated over in some complicated way of the formation yeah. mass that, that we can't pull out now. So therefore, the only realistic proxy we can use is the black hole mass. Yeah, yeah, so it's not like yeah, precisely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. So it just it just seems like you just have to take into account the entire growth history of the black hole rather than simply looking for whether a, a, a halo hosts an AGN or not. Because, I mean, previous work to try and understand whether there was a correlation with the black hole in the COS AGN survey, which looked uh, at samples with AGN and without AGN and the, their halo gas content, found essentially no relation between the two. But we see, of course, that if you integrate this across the whole history, we find this really incredible correlation. One last question? If not, oh, well, I, can say, I mean, I think it, I agree that the <coughs> process of black hole mass might be a divulge, like the. Yeah. And that gets back to morphology. Yeah, so there are various black hole traces. So there, there's the bulge mass. There's also, uh, we also find a really impressive correlation with the alpha enhancement of the halo, which has been shown to be linked with, with uh, the, the, uh, the black hole mass growth. Um, so yeah, plenty of proxies to use. I mean, yeah, velocity dispersion is also, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I haven't uh, investigated in detail yet um, whether the velocity dispersion could be a particularly good proxy. But um, uh, yeah, actually, I think we, we did test this, but we found that actually the, mo the best kind of and clearest um, way of showing it in the paper was actually just showing that the star formation rate uh, reflects this kind of whole picture and process really clearly. And that's the easiest, one of the easiest things to measure in terms of proxies. Thank you very much. And our next speaker today is Stephen Walker. Um, he's coming to us from uh, NASA Goddard, um, where he's a postdoctoral fellow. Um, Stephen previously was at the other Cambridge, um, first um, as a graduate student, working with Andy Fabian, um, and then later as a postdoc. Um, he works on all things galaxy clusters. Um, yesterday, he, at the Galaxy Seminar, he gave a very interesting talk on cluster outskirts. And today, in 
besides the bills, you could be telling us about those fronts. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for in inviting me to talk uh, at this session. So I'm going to talk about uh, my work on on cold fronts. Um, um, so this is an overview of the, of the talk. First of all, I'm going to very briefly talk about a type of uh, image filtering technique that we've been uh, using a lot, and you'll see a lot in the images in this in this talk. Uh, then I'm going to uh, talk about gas sloshing and the cause of nearby clusters, and then talk about the image that you just saw on the title page of uh, large-scale gas sloshing in uh, the Perseus cluster. So this is the filtering technique. Uh, it's called Gaussian gradient magnitude uh, filtering, and it's basically a way of enhancing the contrast of edges uh, in an image. Uh, here we see it on, on, on just on the Chandra image, and this work uh, was done in two papers in, in, in 2016, the first by Jeremy Sanders, who looked at, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, sort of uh, pioneered this technique on uh, nearby clusters, and then I ran it on a large number of clusters in the uh, Chandra archive. So what does this, <laughs> this, this um, so basically what this method does is that it convolves the image of a Gaussian and it works out gradients on that scale. So here it's been convolved in a very small Gaussian, so you can see all the sort of wiggly uh, wrinkle features. I don't know if I'm allowed to go back to England now, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. And then we increase the uh, the gradient, the uh, the kernel size, uh, increasing. So we, here, this is sort of enhancing the, the border scale features. And then you can add these four images together to produce this image in which the, the gradient is sort of probed on all of these spatial scales. So this allows us to create one image showing uh, gradients on multiple spatial scales. And we, uh, we had the, the cover article uh, this year's uh, Chandra newsletter about uh, this, this method showing all of our, our pretty pictures. Um, so the bulk of the talk is on gas slushing in nearby clusters. So um, this was what the NASA website looked like in May, at the beginning of May 2017. This is the press release on my... Uh, result, uh, scientists find giant wave rolling through the Perseus galaxy cluster. So that when we were astronomy picture of the day with this uh, image, and this just shows uh, contrasting between the sort of filtered image and this, the sort of uh, normal image of the Perseus cluster. It uh, allows us to, to, to basically enhance all of the edges, which are particularly interesting uh, to us. And what you can see here is this curved feature here which is a cold front uh, in, the, in the cluster. So we have lots of complex AGN feedback blasting bubbles into the core, and then away from that we have this, this cold front. And the paper is talking about this feature, unusual feature here, which is sort of curved the wrong way. Oh, yes. This is a video showing what, uh, this is made by John Zuhan. I, I don't know if the sound's going to come out this time, but it's... Um, there is music that goes along with this. Um, um, yes. So um, basically what, what is happening in this simulation is that John put, ran the filter on one of his simulations of, of gas sloshing. So we have a small, uh, smaller cluster coming in uh, around about here. Perhaps it's just a sort of bye-bye. And that sets the main core sloshing around, the, the intercluster medium sloshing around uh, the cool core sloshing in the uh, dark matter uh, gravitational potential, and that produces this characteristic <coughs> spiral structure uh, of, of cold fronts. Um, uh, what the, the filter is very good at doing is, en is enhancing all of the complex gradient structure in, in this simulation. Uh, so you see here lots of complex structure, and the particularly interesting feature forms here, where there's a very large concave um, and Kelvin Helmholtz instability. So here we have a velocity shear between uh, two, two fluids. And um, when you have a velocity shear between two fluids, you're in unstable Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities. And we see this a lot in, in nature. So this is, these are called billow clouds. Uh, it's a characteristic type of cloud. Um, and in Jupiter, 
who see these in the in the cloud belts of, of Jupiter and Saturn. So a similar sort of uh, sort of uh, was like a horse's head sort of uh, thing. Uh, but the thing that's different between galaxy clusters and and these objects is that we're talking about an ionized plasma. So that the magnetic field in clusters plays an important role. And uh, one of the reasons why it's believed that the cold fronts don't disintegrate into completely into kelvin helmholtz instabilities is the role of the magnetic field uh, providing a, a blank uh, a draping effect of so the magnetic field drapes over the cold front like a blanket and can act to um, provide uh, support against instabilities so this is showing uh, slides from that video I've changed the color from orange to blue um, and we see here the formation of that that sort of weird concave structure so this is quite enticing is, is what we see in Perseus, that weird, weird uh, concave feature, one of these. So basically this, I, I take this simulation, rotate it around, and take the filter off it, and you produce this image here, so you have this nice cold front, and then this weird bay, uh, the Kelvin Helmholtz wave, and then we compare, this is the actual Chandra image of Perseus, so I've played with the, the color bar to emphasize this structure here, and when you compare them side by side, they look kind of remarkably similar, in ter both in terms of the actual geometry and the spatial scales involved, and also in, in the shape, the sort of a traditional cold front, and then this strange bay feature. So can we? So the bulk of this paper is trying to, to argue that this is a, as a Kelvin Helmholtz wave, and it's far more likely to be that than some sort of inner rim of an AGN inflated uh, cavity. So there are four different ways uh, which combine together to make uh, the strong case against this being an AGN uh, inflated cavity. But the first very obvious one that everyone can see is that this, this feature is only on one side of the cluster. Normally with, with uh, AGN inflated cavities, you have them equally on either side of the cluster, but there is no comparative feature e anywhere around uh, at that radius in this cluster. So it's, it's on one side only. The second thing we can do is to look at profiles of X-ray surface brightness and temperature over this this edge. Um, so here are X-ray surface brightness profiles. So the black is the actual so change uh, the, the X-ray surface brightness over the edge of the the, of the, uh, the bay, which is position is denoted by that red line, and then we compare it to. Uh, the profile over John's uh, simulation, which is the, in the blue profile, and you see that the drop, the, the change is remarkably similar. And then we create a toy model in which we imagine there is a sphere being cut out of this due to an AG, uh, AGN inflated cavity. So we imagine, so we reconstruct the X ray emission that should be there, and then we take out the sphere, and then we work out the drop in X ray surface brightness. It should be over that. And that is shown by the green line. And we see that that strongly disagrees. It's far more, far steeper. When we look at the temperature uh, profile, so here's the temperature. The, this, the data points are shown in, in black. So inside here, it's cold. And then as it gets hotter out here, so there's the big temperature jump. And when we compare that to, to John's simulations in the blue, that looks not bad in terms of agreement. And if we play the same game of making a, a toy model of taking out a, a spherical cavity, we see that the temperature jump is actually quite small, way smaller, significantly smaller than the actually observed jump. And you could imagine, well, what if it's not a sphere? What if it's some sort of oblate uh, American football type shape? So if you want to, to say, if you want to make this bigger, we could try and take out some sort of weird uh, you know, rugby ball <coughs> shape in the plane of the sky to make that bigger, but that would also make this <coughs> bigger. So you can't satisfy both uh, conditions, uh, the, the temperature and the, the, uh, the uh, surface brightness distribution uh, using this sort of cavity model. The third thing is to look at uh, the, the distribution of metals in the, in the Perseus cluster. So this is a simulation from Elder Elka Rodiga. Uh, looking at uh, what happens to the metal distribution when uh, in a gas sloshing. So here we see the initial situation where the metals are 
peak to the core and sort of decreasing outwards. And in here, this is it's some time later where some sloshing has happened, and we see there's uh, a nice uh, edge in the, the metals here and in the, in the cold front where we go from a high metal environment and drop down to a low metal environment very suddenly. So over a cold front, you would expect the metal to be very high and then drop down to a low valley. And that's what we see. So the black is the, uh, the, met the profile over the bay. So we have the high metal abundance here, and we have the bay, and then drops down. And if you take the, the metal abundance profile over this normal part of the cold front, uh, that is shown in the pink. So again, it, they look, they're indistinguishable from one another you have a high metallicity dropping to a low metallicity. And this is actually the opposite of what you would expect for an AGN inflated cavity, because it's known that in the directions of uh, AGN inflated cavities, you see excesses in, in metal abundance. So this is work done by Kirkpatrick et al, uh, looking at these are maps of metal abundance, and the, the sectors are showing the directions of AGN feedback, so the bubble directions in these clusters. And there's a correlation where, where the, the AGN feedback, where the bubbles are going up, there's an excess in metal abundance. So this is, a, again, an office opposite to what we actually observe. And the fourth and final thing is to look at the radio data. Because, again, this differs between the two different possibilities. So here uh, is work by John. Um, this is a normal type of uh, cold front there. So it's cold front. And when you look at the radio data, there's a radio halo. And these tend to be bounded by, by cold fronts, so that the radio, the radio halo uh, follows that of cold front quite nicely. Whereas AGN flayed cavities are filled with um, relativistic material, which uh, is uh, bright in x rays. So, where you see the cavities in, in x rays, you see um, uh, radio enhancements. And this is a, another spectacular example where the cavities in the radio are filled by, the cavities in the x-ray are filled by radio emission. So what do we see when we plot the radio contours over this image of Perseus? Um, do, do we see that it's filled with radio emission? No, we see that the radio emission does seem to follow that edge quite nicely, just as it follows this part of the, of the cold front. So all the four combined together, I argue in this paper that this feature is far more likely um, to be some sort of uh, kelder helmholtz sensitivity in this cold front rather than the inner rim of an agn inflated cavity. So if we take this, we can then uh, look at different uh, simulations. So th these are all simulations that John did. Uh, and so this is the actual observation for, for the uh, cold front in here. In these two simulations, the magnetic field is lower than what was shown in the video. And we see there's a lot more structure, a lot more uh, <coughs> instability that has sort of fallen apart. And that's a lot more structure than we actually see here. This is a very smooth <coughs> edge. So we can sort of qual uh, qualitatively rule out those as, as being too, too weak a magnetic field. So we're looking for the Goldilocks, uh, you know, uh, the one that fits best. This simulation has a stronger magnetic, initial magnetic field than um, what was shown in the video. And you see it's so strong that that, that bay feature doesn't form. It's just a nice smooth edge. So we can, we can wave our hands and argue that that magnetic field is too strong. And that this one here, I won't, I won't go into to that, what exactly that, that means uh, for time purposes, but this uh, allows us to, to, to match images effectively and find uh, the, the best fitting magnetic field by, by eye. And we see these sort of bay features in other clusters. So this is the Centaurus cluster. Again, it's the filter ran on it, and we see this bay feature here. But it's a, it's a lot different. This is far close to the core. Um, this is only around 20 kiloparsecs away from the core. But again, we see the radio emission contours uh, trying to avoid um, that. And if we compare that to a different slice, an earlier slice of the simulations, which is what's shown in here, we see a formation of a similar type of structure, which is sort of more shallow. Um, and again, if we increase the magnetic field compared to this simulation, that in this one, 
uh, that they that feature doesn't form. So again, this is giving and the the magnetic best fitting magnetic field in Centaurus is the same as the one uh, for Perseus. So it's not it's not a completely different uh, simulation. It seems to seems to work out. And in April 1795, which is further away but still a nearby cluster, um, this doesn't have a filter run on it. So I don't, I'm not sure how clear this is going to be, but there was sort of like a, a bite mark almost taken out of the, uh, the top right-hand corner there in the x-rays, and we see the radio curving nicely around that as well. And if you play the game, basically, uh, so the main cold front is here. If you rotate the image around so that the main cold front is here, the sort of angle between cold front and bay is roughly the same as what you see in, in Perseus. So the, they are different in spatial scale, but they, they look remarkably similar in geometry. So finally, the, th the final thing I want to talk about is uh, a large scale cold front in Perseus cluster. This is a paper that I had accepted uh, and published in Nature Astronomy earlier uh, this year. We were on the, the front cover of Nature Astronomy. Uh, so for this, the image has been rotated around. So this is the, the image we've been looking at of the Perseus cluster. There's that, there's that bay to see what it's like. And the, the paper is about this structure here, which we saw on the title slide, which is a cold front. And in, in that video, we saw this, with time, the spiral just sort of grows and moves outwards. And this is a sort of extreme example of that, where this cold front has just continued to rise outwards, out to around half the virial radius uh, of the Perseus cluster. Obviously, that, that takes a long amount of time. So based on simulations, this is around five giga years in age. And with time, all sorts, uh, there's all sorts of questions of can the, the magnetic field keep supporting it all the way out there? Uh, will, it, will it eventually disintegrate in, into kelvin helmholtz sensibilities, or will the fusion blur out uh, any sorts of edges? So this is based on the XMM mosaic. So it's a really big, thick edge. Um, because of a sort of poor spatial resolution of XM Newton. And what I wanted to know is, is this edge still sharp, uh, despite all this, all its age, and despite rising out through half the atmosphere of the cluster. So I got uh, Chandra time to look at this, this edge, just to actually resolve it properly spatially. And this <laughs> is showing, basically, this is actually the temperature map. This is the observed temperature map for Perseus for this entire mosaic. And this is a simul this is one of John's simulations. So we see the cool core there. And then this whole cold front is actually like a band of cold, cold gas. And it looks very similar to, to this sort of banana shaped uh, in, 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 uh, in the simulations. And now if we focus on the actual Chandra observation, so this is a temperature map from the uh, XMM data, so it's quite poor resolution here. We see the Chandra observation, and what we see is that the edges are incredibly sharp. They're actually consistent uh, within the, the quality of the data with instantaneous edges. And um, the main thing that we remark in the paper is that instead of one edge, we actually see two edges. And in this temperature map, we see that there appears to be some sort of cold hook that comes out and it's separated by a, a hot a hot channel, um, which has never been seen before. So we had to dig into the, uh, the simulations to decide to see what, what this could be. And um, if you look at the, if you look at the simulations, this is a temperature map from the simulation early on in the cold front formation history. So this cold front is first formed. And then the, at this, the next, another stage, the lowest entropy gas is falling back. And you can see that this produces a form of hook. And what, in, in the simulations, this hook can just propagate out out to the edge of the screen, up to the, the end of the, uh, the, the simulation. So we, we sort of uh, postulate that this, what we could be observing is this, this hook, and that's the magnetic field has been able to, to uh, preserve this. And uh, if here we compare the observed temperature map with these are both simulations, this is a simulated temperature map, uh, just, uh, uh, yeah sort of rotated around to match it. So we see a hook type uh, feature. And this is surface brightness uh, 
where we see two edges. And we can play around with the magnetic field of this as, as well. So this is, a, this is a, a simulation that best fits the data. If we have a um, stronger magnetic field, then the magnetic field can act to, to prevent this, this sort of splitting, this hook from, from forming, in which case we only see one edge in both the temperature and surface brightness. If we have a weaker magnetic field in, this, in, in very hand wavy general terms, then this, the, uh, it, it falls apart into Kelvin Helmholtz. Uh, rolls, which are these sort of rolly bits here. And again, we only see one edge in both of these uh, situations. So again, there's this Goldilocks area where we c we're able to compare the observed images and temperature maps with the simulations and put a constraint on uh, the initial uh, magnetic field distribution before all this sloshing has started. And another cool thing I'm not sure how clear this is going to be, is that this, this opening angle between of the hook depends on the viewing angle. So all of these simulations are assuming sloshing in the plane of the sky. Obviously, if we have some angle to the plane of the sky, that can change things. So this is sloshing in the plane of the sky. If I move this out of the plane of the sky towards you, you can see it's sort of rotating around. And as you do this, the the opening angle changes, it gets bigger, and then eventually it disappears. You can't actually, it's hard to see. So basically, I'm just rotating the cluster around like this. And we can basically put some estimate on, by using that angle, estimating the, the line of sight of the cluster to the sky. And we get around 30, 30 degrees if we assume that that's sort of the best fitting. It's between those two slices is, is the best fitting slice. So that's the end of the, the talk. In conclusion, um, I'm saying that the, the Bay in Perseus is consistent with being a concave cold front, and is most consistent with that being due to um, uh, Kelp giant Kelvin Helvons instabi instability, the, the radio data, the X-ray, surface brightness, temperature, metal distribution are most consistent with this. All of these things are inconsistent with the idea of this being an agn plated cavity. Um, and if this is true, we are able to put some uh, basic constraints on uh, intracluster uh, medium physics and the magnetic field. Um, um, we see similar features in the Centaurus cluster in April 1795, and all of these cases seem roughly consistent with this particular initial ratio of magnetic to thermal pressure ratio. Um, thank you. <laughs>
cluster merger mm -hmm. or, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. At some, like more than 550 years ago. Yeah, so they, 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 they sort of, um, so these are separate events. So the one that forms the big one. That, that's, that would be around 50 oh, yeah. years ago. So these are, these are younger. So okay, so that was more, is, is there any evidence of that more recent merger? I don't know if you can track that. No, I mean, it's very hard to, to that. I mean, the, the sort of evidence is the sourcing itself, the really. Sourcing. I mean, the, the, the idea is that it's, it's like informing dark matter halo <coughs> that you, you but that they just pass it through the How much, system. how massive of the dark matter halo is it? Uh, so what, what, do you remember what the, the one mass, fifth. one fifth, yeah. One fifth. yeah. So there would be, with the galaxies associated with that group or whatever, I guess be dynamically mixed yeah. with the... Yeah. I mean, the, 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 sim the simulation, I, I mean, I guess if it had galaxies, but the simulation is of the dark matter halo. Right, but can you yeah. see that observed? Uh, my, my understanding is that's really hard. Is that? Probably. Yeah. Probably. Do, do you know if has anyone these tried? Are, these are unanswered questions. Yeah. <laughs> it, would, it, would, it would probably be really hard to observe, for example, a bifurcation of the redshift distribution. Yeah. Though, but it would probably also persist over five billion years. Okay. So very hard to, to observe, but very long lived. Okay, yes. Okay, so, so maybe, maybe it's. So we see Kelvin Helmholtz along the boundaries of magnetic spheres yeah. in our solar system. Yes. Yes. Um, and a lot of the time we detect them in situ by changes in the velocity distribution. Yeah. I guess the spatial you wouldn't be able to resolve with like the BSF or something. It's spectral lines from different locations along your KHI. No, it's uh, that, that's not yeah. with not with current instruments. Maybe maybe in a few years' time with um, Prism. Um, and definitely in 2030 with Athena, I think, yeah. Um, and, and so your hook feature, yes. is that like a, plas a plasmoid, like a breaking up of magnetic field and like a little yeah. magnetic flux rate? Yeah. So it's sim it's similar to a Rayleigh Taylor, in, is, is that, that's... Okay. Not so much a plasmoid, because the magnetic field is still very weak. Sure, okay. Um, and so also sometimes when you get carbon complex like mm. this, get twisting of magnetic field lines, yeah. and then you can get reconnection of heat in the plasma. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I wonder if maybe that might be something else you could check on the boundary yeah. with chrism or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's definitely a lot more that can be done. <laughs>